Good evening, candidates, South Metro Democratic women's members, and to you, our viewing audience. Welcome to this evening's District 62 Forum. South Metro Democratic Women's Council is a local chapter of the Georgia Federation of Democratic Women, which is a sister chapter of the Georgia Democratic Party. Our chapter was formed in 2014, and we meet on the fourth Thursday of each month at 7 p.m. Our service area covers all eight cities in the South Fulton area and a part of Southwest Atlanta. Our mission, to engage women of South Fulton in a variety of political activities provide members with critical information regarding local issues, organize education and voter registration activities for the community, one of which you are participating in tonight. This is one of our projects. Number four, identify and encourage women to run for office at all levels. Thank you for joining, and now we will have a moment of silent meditation. Amen. Dr. Bello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, before you to... before you start, let me just say this is for District 61, not 62. That's a typo on my part. This is a District 61 forum. Now, Dr. Bello. Okay. Uh, good evening again. Um, we'd like for you to be aware of our form, uh, forum rules this evening. We want you to watch for the fan. Gloria held up that fan earlier. That indicates your time is up. If you do not hear, adhere to the fan, you will be muted. The moderator will call on each candidate in the order she chooses. Each candidate will have two minutes to introduce themselves. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer questions. If a candidate's name is called by another candidate, that candidate has the right to a two minute rebuttal. In other words, if you call Sheila's name while you're giving some information, Sheila has a right to a two minute rebuttal to what you said. Each candidate rebuttal should be only two minutes. So Sheila will only have two minutes to answer you. Each candidate will be given two minutes to make a closing statement. So those are our rules for engagement tonight and I hope you adhere to them. Thank you. The introduction of our moderators this time. This, did Ms. Respis come back? Yes, ma'am. I am here. Okay. Okay, so I am Deanna Respers, and I am excited to have introduced um, Elise Fisher tonight as our moderator. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Elise, uh, Elise is a, is a known chain agent change agent in our South Fulton community, always looking to effectuate positive change, even in the most difficult situations, or I would say ingrained mindsets at times. Um, she has a passion for individual growth and is a professional certified coach and has over 20 years experience. Moreover, Elise is very involved in our community. Uh, she sits on several boards, uh, including the South Fulton Empowerment Coalition, the Cedar Grove uh, uh, neighborhood neighborhood association um, and and several others. Elise also holds a bachelor's degree from Cornell University and a master's degree from uh, Darden the University of Virginia's Darden Graduate School of Business. I now introduce to you Elise Fisher for the evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and. Candidates, thank you all for joining. Thank you for the listening audience and of course all of our members who are here tonight. Um, we will start with introductions. Um, every candidate will get two minutes for introduction. Um, every question, candidates will have two minutes 
So I think that was said before. Um, but let's start with the introductions and we will start with um, our incumbent, uh, Representative Bruce. All right, hi everybody. Uh, first, let me just thank all of the uh, ladies of the uh, South Metro Democratic Women's Council for hosting this. Uh, it is very important for people to know uh, all of the things that are happening in our community and who is involved. So I appreciate uh, that opportunity. I was elected in 2002, started serving in 2003. And uh, I serve on the Appropriations Committee, the Judiciary Committee, uh, Small Business Development, Aging, and Game Fish and Parks. Um, the, the two uh, committees that are probably the two most powerful committees uh, in there, the Appropriations Committee and the Judiciary Committee, um, those are committees that you have to earn uh, the opportunity to get on. And, uh, and I've done that. Um, a new person going in will not have an opportunity to serve on those committees. Um, and so if something is not broke, no need to fix it. Um, we also have, um, in terms of things that I've done, uh, people will be talking about things that they're going to do. Some of the things that I've already done, one is to give you the right to vote for the city of South Fulton, uh, which was passed and uh, we now have a city. Uh, in addition to that, I've added the Fulton Industrial Area to it, which gave the city another $12 million uh, that it didn't have before. Um, I've introduced and passed legislation that uh, dealt with creating uh, rules for construction so that people were not being ripped off anymore by contractors. Um, and there are a number of other things uh, that I've dealt with over the years. Uh, and, you know, before I close, I am on the committee that deals with the only thing that we're required to do, which is the budget. Uh, I serve on the Appropriations Committee uh, um, and sit, have a seat at the table as we talk about how we're going to spend the $64 billion in federal and state money uh, that has to go through that process. I look forward to the questions and uh, hopefully I stay within my two minutes. I didn't see the flag come up. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Bruce. Um, Monique McCoy, candidate McCoy, your introduction, please. Good evening, everyone. I am Monique McCoy and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for providing this platform as an opportunity for us to introduce ourselves and uh, I am running because while we have represent while we have a representative in office, we don't have representation. My platform focuses on five key areas, but of course, there are many things that need to be addressed. And I plan on allowing the people to be in full control of what the agenda is, what the agenda is that I will fight for once I'm elected. Primarily, I want to focus on equity in education, smart growth and development, enhanced rights for homeowners and property owners, quality jobs that pay a living wage, and access to affordable health care. These are the things that I know are not just issues for our local area, but these are the things that I want to fight for. And again, after I'm elected, I want to start meeting with the people immediately, immediately thereafter, not waiting until I'm sworn in next year in order to find out from the people what more we want to do, what more needs to be done, what concerns are out there that maybe I'm not quite aware of yet, setting the agenda so that I'm ready to begin fighting on day one. And so again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm a veteran, I'm an educator, I'm a small business owner, uh, have a history of being a community volunteer. I happen to believe it's important that I'm a mother and a grandmother as well. And I'm looking forward to continuing my lifetime of community service and public service by serving um, District 61 constituents to the best of my ability, remaining accessible, remaining um, transparent. Thank you. Thank you as well. 
Uh, candidate Kemp, Rashawn Kemp, your introduction. Good evening, everyone. And first, thank you to you, Elise, and the women of the South Metro Democratic Women's Council for hosting this event. Uh, these events are so important to inform voters and really appreciate you all for doing this. My name is Rashawn Kemp and no relationship to the governor whatsoever, <laughs> but I am very happy and excited to be here. I am running for state representative in House District 61 because I am a father, educator, and community advocate. As I have been knocking on doors and speaking with voters in our community, I have heard them time and time again say the status quo should be no more. And so I'm running to represent our community focused on education, expanding quality options in our community and ensuring our public school system delivers for our children like mine. I have an 11 month old daughter, Brooklyn and an 18 year old son, Jaden, who is getting ready to graduate on election day. Uh, and we'll be going up to Tennessee State on a full ride scholarship. So just wanna say how proud I am of him. Uh, but ultimately I am running for this seat because it is incumbent on all of us to do what we can to help uh, benefit, uh, improve our communities and ensure that we are working for the people. And that is what our, our voters want. And so ultimately I am running as a educator. I have been a teacher. I've served as a principal and also a nonprofit executive. I have experienced turning around at high school. I was uh, became the principal of a high school at the age of 27 years old. Uh, and I have been successful in education and working on policy at the Capitol ever since and being an advocate. I am someone that was raised by my great grandmother and I know how important education is being the largest line item in our state budget. And I have experience in that field. And so I believe it's time to send more educators to our Capitol and I look forward to serving the constituents in House District 61. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kemp. Um, lastly, Mr. Dawson, candidate Robert Dawson. Good evening, am I unmuted? You are unmuted. Okay, thanks to all for having me this evening. My name is Robert Dawson. I'm a Democrat running for Georgia State House District 61, which, compromise, which comprises uh, South Fulton, Lithia Springs, Douglasville, East Point, Union City, and parts of Southwest Atlanta and Austell. I was born right next door in Birmingham, but when it was time for me to plant my roots and start a family, I decided to make this community my home 18 years ago. As you and your members know, I'm a longtime supporter of all your efforts, and I'm humbled and proud to spend this time with you tonight. I'm an established Democrat. I believe in the people's right to vote, and I believe that health care is a right for all and not just a privilege for some. We must expand Medicare and Medicaid. And then there are these important statewide issues, but there's also things specific to the district that I'm representing that we have to address. We're in a state of emergency and we have to focus on public safety. We've all seen the news this weekend. And just last week, we saw the very entertainers our youth look up to swept up in gang and criminal allegations. While I'm focused on protecting civil rights and ending police Brutality, I'm also working hard to stand in the breach and steer these young people away from gangs and crime and poor choices. There's things we must do across the board like funding youth programs at the taxpayer expenses. Finally, we need state funds to expand public transportation and mobility. MARTA, MARTA mobility, tons of seniors and working families who don't drive and they still need to get around. Let's bring tax dollars to the south side of the city. I'm looking forward to a hearty conversation. Again, I'm Robert Dawson, Democrat running for District 61. She's muted. Thank you, Mr. Dawson. Um, and you, um, you shared quite a bit of information in your introduction, as did all candidates. Uh, but I'll start this next question with you, Candidate Dawson. Um, what are your top three priorities for District 61? Number one, pro, uh, my number one priority is the hospital issue. We must bring affordable health care, quality health care south of I-20. Number two is back to that issue of public safety. 
I did an event yesterday or a day before with the youth in District 1 of the city of South Fulton. We had youth from all over the city. And again, we have to stand in the breach in face of the violence, the crime, the gang activity, steer them away from those activities and use state funds to educate them. We have to do away with privatized um, prison industry here. There's no less than a meat grinder for our young minds and have programs and training even inside of the prisons that'll give these, um, give these young people a brighter future and more opportunity. So, so hospitals, public safety, and, and uh, of course, social justice goes along with that. And then finally, initiatives for our youth. Thank you. Um, candidate McCoy, you shared your five key areas um, at, when you provided your introduction. Um, there was one thing you mentioned, homeowner rights. Tell me, what is it you want to accomplish in that space? I want to accomplish um, that homeowners and property owners are not bullied and overruled by developers who come into the local areas and lobby city government and, and county government leaders to get their way over what's best for homeowners and property owners. I have experienced that as, the, as a board member in our community, the Regency Oaks Neighborhood Association. I served on that board from 2019 until just recently. And uh, we ran into an issue with DR Horton specifically. And I tell you, it was not a pleasant experience trying to serve our community and uh, represent what the people in our community had by and large said they wanted and waging this, uh, I hate to say battle, it's, it, I don't like to be hyperbolic, but it seemed to be just that because DR Horton lobbies our city government um, frequently on a weekly basis and they were not willing to negotiate in order to be neighborly and meet the needs of the people in our community. So that was a difficult experience. And I've talked to other board members from other communities and they've run into some of the same issues. And so I, I believe somebody needs to step in the breach, stand in the gap to fight for homeowners and property owners rights to be enforced as they are already written but then maybe to enhance them in such a way that developers can't just come in and have their way and community members find out uh, after it's too late that there is a big construction happening next door to them or, or in a way that would be directly adjacent to their community and, and they don't have any say so over it. And um, anytime you find the people being uh, less powerful uh, have, after having invested so much time and money in their property, that's an issue that we Thank need you. to address. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McCoy. Um, Representative Bruce, what, are, what would be your top three priorities for District 61 should you be reelected? Well, you know, obviously education is uh, big. Um, we have to make sure that our public schools and the public money is used for public schools. Um, obviously there's a movement of people that would like to see uh, our public funds, you know, go into private schools, go into uh, situations where uh, our students would, you know, they, they keep saying they want the money to follow the student. The problem is that if the student gets in the public, in a private school, there are many times when they can't afford to stay there because it's just too expensive. And then when they come back to the public schools, the money doesn't follow them back. So we, we need to make sure that we use public money for public schools. Also, voting rights is very important to me, making sure that people have uh, easier opportunities to cast their vote. I have legislation that's uh, pending, you know, I have to reintroduce it, but it's pending. Um, that would allow people to vote at any polling place on election day. Uh, right now, you know, you have to, you know, depending on what side of town you live on, uh, you may have to try to, you know, skip work or whatever to get uh, to be able to vote. And then um, 
expansion of Medicaid is also uh, very important that we have to be able to give people access uh, to health care. Uh, those are some of the things, but there's a, a whole lot of things that still need to be worked on. The budget uh, obviously is, is the biggest piece of this thing is determining how do we get resources um, in our community uh, that will help you know, do the things that we need to get done. So uh, education, voting rights, uh, health care, and, uh, and we'll talk about the homelessness issue you know, when we throughout the, the meeting here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kemp, same question. What will be your top three priorities? Yeah, thank you for that question. So as I have walked the community, knocked on doors and talked to voters, uh, their issues are, I've heard them loud and clear. And I believe these are the top three uh, in my opinion and uh, based upon what I'm hearing from voters. And that is improving public safety, improving our access to the ballot box and fighting against what these Republicans are trying to do uh, to take us backwards and then also health care. And so I'm going to start off with health care. Um, it is unbelievable to me that we continue to have such inequities in our communities. Uh, I-20 continues to be a dividing line in terms of the access that we have in terms of education, in terms of out, uh, outcomes, in terms of healthcare. And so it should not be just, oh, well, that's you know the way it is for us to lose the only emergency medical service south of I-20 in Fulton County. And so that should be priority number one. And uh, in terms of addressing healthcare, uh, so that is one thing that I will work very hard on. Uh, one thing why I believe we do that is to reform the uh, certificate of need laws that exist in Georgia. And then in addition to that, being a strong advocate, uh, you know, we should be fighting and standing loud and clear that that is not acceptable, that we have lost that access in our community. And then also uh, fighting for women's rights. Uh, they are under attack right now. And that is quality health care that women are able to have access to. And it should not be any man or legislative body telling a woman what to do with her body. And then finally, in expanding Medicaid. Uh, in expanding Medicaid will ensure 500,000 more Georgians. And that is part of the issue with the, hosp the hospital not providing the services in South Fulton, and we need more people insured, and we need more people having quality jobs. In addition, I want to go towards voting. Uh, I have proposed that voting should be a statewide holiday, that we should make uh, access to voting uh, easier, not harder, and then finally improving our public safety. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, this next question, given you know some of what was just said, this next question will be for Representative Bruce. Um, given that Republicans rule here in the state of Georgia, how do you build support for Democrat sponsored legislation and what have been your greatest successes in this area? You know, just like anything else, you know, you have to pick a pick what you want to do in life, so to speak. And in order to get legislation passed, you have to be able to form relationships uh, on both sides of the aisle. Uh, and I've been able to do that. You know, I. I, I have not had to compromise any of my um, beliefs, any of the things that I stand for as a Democrat. Uh, and I am a longtime Democrat. I started the Young Democrats in, in Georgia uh, back in 1973. And uh, so I, I stand by the Democratic principle, but at the same time, uh, especially when you're in the minority, you have to be able to form these relationships. So you find things uh, that you can show the Republican Party uh, that they will benefit from as well uh, if they, you know, put their hands together with us and work together. You know, we, we can't always be combative. You sometimes just have to compromise and you have to understand this process and how it works. Uh, and I have that experience. You know, I've been doing this for a long time and uh, I've been able to get uh, significant bills passed as I said, you know, getting the city of South Fulton uh, passed, getting $12 million uh, to go into uh, the city of South Fulton that wasn't going there before, uh, being able to get the Parent Protection Act passed uh, to protect people who have to go to the child's school uh, for different things so that they don't lose their job. Um, 
and all, all kinds of things that, that you just have to do to make sure uh, that you are in fact uh, working together with the entire um, General Assembly and getting things done. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dawson, what would you do differently? Well, um, you know, I certainly respect what Mr. Bruce has done and a lot of our incumbents around the area. And, you know, it's I pinch myself sometimes being in this race to, um, you know, to now be in the mix to have my name in the mix with men and women I looked up to, you know, since, uh, since 2002, 2004. So not to detract from anything that our leaders have done, I think that it's just time for a change. I'm 50 years old and I was 20 years, 28 years old when Mr. Bruce came into power. So I think, I just think it's time for fresh new ideas I have no problem reaching across the aisle. And I think the one thing that I'll do differently is that I wanna be a collaborator and a, and a peacemaker with all uh, parties, Republican, Democrat, people in the state house, people in the county and people in these municipalities. You know, there are so many political beefs and so much intrigue and fisticuffs and drama involved in politics today. And I think it's becoming, the government's becoming ineffective. And so I think we need functional government, effective leadership that's willing to check the ego at the door. I had a wonderful a voter I met on the trail say that there's no self in service. And I think that's so true. So what I would do differently is just dedicate every fiber in my being to, to making peace and collaborating and working for the good of our seniors, our families, and our youth. Thank you. Moving on to the new topic. Um, and this is about uh, house can building. Can I ask a question? You, you, you said if a name is mentioned that uh, you can- Very fair. That, Two minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, and I, and I appreciate um, Mr. Dawson's comments, but uh, first, you know, I want to, you know, step away from stepping into power. You know, I don't see this as, as power. I see this as service, and, and it's a difference. Um, the reality is that we have people that are in the General Assembly who do think this is for power, and, uh, and it's not. It's purely for service. And, you know, one of the things that um, when you say what would you do different, you know, we all, you know, learn or should learn from things that, that we do. Uh, one of the things that I would uh, do different would be to try to make sure that, that, that we have more people involved in the process and, and to, to get people to learn this process. And that's, you know, if I have to, you know, say anything that I've, you know, not been able to get done is to identify people you know, to, to, to come after, you know, because we all got to stop at some point. At some point, all of us are going to get out of this. And, and what I have not been able to do yet is find the, the person is going to uh, follow me in, in this work and, and make sure that they're educated. And that's part of what I'm going to do uh, this next term is identify uh, a successor and try to work with that individual, make sure that when it's time for them to take over, they really know what they're doing. Thank you. Next next topic. Um, and this is about House Bill 319. Um, and each candidate will get this question. We will start with Mr. Kemp. Um, what is your position on gun control and House Bill 319 signed by the governor that allows Georgia gun owners to carry a concealed handgun in public without first obtaining a license from the state? It's ridiculous that um, our safety, our community safety is being part of this uh, political cycle, trying to get political points. It's dangerous. 
There are criminals who now have access to getting a gun because they don't have to go through a process that has actually stopped people that have criminal backgrounds from getting fire firearms. You know, as, as I mentioned, I have a 18 year old son. And so as every parent I'm sure goes through, as your child gets older, it doesn't get easier for you to sleep at night. It actually probably gets harder because you're concerned about where they are at, in later uh, hours at, at night. And so um, it's dangerous, it's disastrous. And I will do everything and I can, that I can in my power to fight against these things, to speak out, but also uh, to, to work across the aisle and get them to see that these things that they're trying to do um, are dangerous for our communities and they're hurting our communities. Uh, and you know, I, I think it's important to be mindful of the fact that these are lives. Uh, we just saw what happens when guns are in the wrong hands. And so we are now praying for yet another community that's been ravaged by gun violence and hate uh, through racism uh, up in Buffalo. And so we need to stop this. We need to have common sense gun reforms. It is supported by the vast majority of Americans. And in addition to that, it's supported by gun owners. It is not anti-gun to have pro, uh, to be pro uh, common sense reform. And I Uh-oh. It appears that we have uh, lost Mr. Kim. And so I'll, I'll ask the timekeeper to note how many more seconds he may have had. Um, we can give them back to him when he comes back. Uh, but for now, let's move on to um, Mr. Dawson. <clears throat> Again, your position on House Bill 319 and gun control. So I'm going to I'm going to be honest here. You know, I'm not going to I'm not going to play politics and I'm not going to try to throw red meat to the, my base, which is what the Republican Party is doing here. I'm OK with the letter of this law. We have the Second Amendment. We have the right to bear arms. I'm a country boy myself. You know, I grew up hunting, fishing. I own guns. Um, I collect guns. I, I have uh long rifles right here in this house today. I enjoy going to the gun range. I enjoy um, shooting. But at the same time, the spirit of this law is that um, it's, it's reckless. What, what Mr. Kemp and the Republicans are doing is very reckless and they're using something so serious and dangerous as a political football. That's one thing I've never done and I don't believe in playing political footballs. But the letter of this law to have um, the, to, that we don't require a permit for a citizen to carry, I'm okay with that. Beyond that, I do believe that we need uh, gun reform drastically. My little mentees and, and, and apprentices, you have young men who are developing with all this, these emotions and hormones. A lot of times they're mixing it with marijuana and they're drinking. And I can tell you right now, all of them are walking around these streets right now and they're packing. So it's a dangerous situation. There's too much violence. There's too much death. It's a disgrace. It's something I've been fighting for since 1994. And before that, I was chairman of the youth for the Mothers Against Violence as a young man. So something has to be done about this, but I'll be perfectly honest. I'm not gonna sit here and lie. I'm okay with the fact that you should not in the United States of America be required to go to a county government and get a permit to carry a gun. But I'm not okay with what Mr. Kemp and, and what Mr. and what these Republicans are doing with the spirit of the law. It's malicious, it's wrong, and we're gonna fight for gun violence, gun reform. Thank you. Representative Bruce. Well, I do believe in the right to bear arms, but I also believe in the responsibility to uh, be responsible as you do it. Um, the whole idea, you know, I, I had a press conference, you know, right after he signed that bill. So I'll use the same words that I used then. That was the dumbest thing I've ever heard. The idea that you will be able to uh, control gun violence by giving more people guns without any check, so to speak, on those per on those individuals before you give them the gun doesn't make any sense to me at all. Um, I, I do think that there should be some uh, vetting of individuals before you give them a permit. You know, there are people that are mentally ill, whether we 
like to admit it or not, they're mentally ill and they should not be walking around with guns. And uh, I'm concerned about our police officers and our other uh, first responders, the, um, the firefighters, everyone, uh, when they walk into a situation, they won't know whether somebody is carrying a gun or not. Uh, that's dangerous and it's not safe for those individuals. So uh, I do believe, as I said, in the right to bear arms, I think people should do it. I own uh, guns myself and I like to go to the range and I can shoot. I went to a military school, so um, I learned how to use it and I learned how to use it responsibly. And I just think that everyone uh, that is bearing arms should be responsible in their uh, in that process. Thank you. Candidate McCoy, Monique McCoy. I, I do believe that um, this bill being passed and signed into law was a dreadful mistake. Uh, we need to get guns under control. I believe that uh, licensure should be conditioned upon a background check to make sure that this person who is applying to uh, carry a weapon, particularly uh, in the open, open carry, um, should have the right credentials and should have been checked out. I believe that this policy makes policing a lot more difficult makes it a challenging job even more so challenging. And even outside of all of that, we have an issue with too many guns being on the streets. Um, when a police officer shows up at a situation or on the scene where there's an active shooter, I still believe that if there is a white man standing there and a black man standing there nine times out of 10, they're going to look at the black man as the one who is the threat and assume that the Caucasian man is trying to be the hero. We do not have a, a, a just system. And so I think anything that makes this situation with guns worse is a problem. And, and House Bill 319 certainly throws a, a lot of fuel onto that fire. It's something we need to address. It's passed, but I don't think we should just let it lie as it is. I need to go in there and be able to fight for us to make the changes so that we have common sense gun laws in Georgia. I do believe in the second amendment. I know how to shoot a gun. I served nine years in the United States Air Force. So I'm trained on both the nine millimeter and the M16. Um, but I still believe that we need to have common sense gun laws. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll stick with you um, for this next question. Uh, there's a mental health related bill that does not allow pictures to be taken in public mental facilities. Given the news reports about the bad things happening in these facilities, do you think this is a good bill? If so, why? If not, what revisions would you suggest? Wow. No pictures in public health facilities? Public mental health facilities, yes. And so you've got to find a way to strike a balance between um, privacy and, and public concern. I have to admit, I don't have an answer right now about what we should do. I think that would take um, talking to, to people, getting stakeholders input and, and, and talking to people who have experience even being in um, public mental health facilities to find out uh, what's the best way to address both the issue of privacy and uh, security. Both are equally important. And so I, I'm not gonna try to present myself as already having that answer. My approach to serving District 61 will be a relationship and resource-based approach. And with relationships, you've got to hear from all sides and come together with the consensus and develop the agenda and develop the items that we are going to fight for. And that's what I would do in trying to address this issue. Thank you. Candidate Dawson, Robert Dawson, same question. Could you restate the question for me? Yes, there is a mental health related bill that does not allow pictures to be taken in public mental facilities. Given the consistent reports about bad things happening in these facilities, do you think this is a good bill? If so, why? If not, what revisions would you suggest? Yep, uh, I've seen that uh, mental health parity bill 
that you're referring to, and I think it's a right step to, in the direction um, of uh, health reform when it comes to people with mental disabilities. And I'm also working with a lot of disability groups in the area. I was on a call just this week with a group of advocates for disability rights. So um, specifically with that point of uh, being able to take photos, I think that we need oversight and I think that we need uh, more regulation. So um, I I'm just advocating for reform of mental health and also the prison industrial complex and also disability rights. When we talk about disability rights and mental health rights, that's the largest minority in the world. Uh, and that's a minority that anyone can join at any time, the disabled and those who, who struggle with mental health disabilities. So definitely want to continue down this path of reforming those laws. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kemp, welcome back. Same question. Do you need it Thank repeated? You. Sorry about that. No, I, I got the question. Thank you, at least. Uh, you know, they say when things go wrong, as they sometimes will, but glad to be back. Uh, you know, I am married to a school counselor, and that actually concerns me uh, because I think about um, folks who are dealing with mental illness and who, like you mentioned, uh, there are issues in facilities where we have to be concerned about the fair treatment of our loved ones uh, and those we care about. Um, so, you know, just on the surface, that bill definitely concerns me, that language. Uh, you know, I think that we have to think about the people that are, that are on the other end of that, uh, you know, so I, I would not support just a blanket where there should not be any photos in a mental health facility because I think about the fair treatment of those that are in those facilities. Uh, and so I think that that would restrict uh, the ability for loved ones and others, even us uh, in the public, to know about about what is happening in such facilities. So I think that is really important. You, uh, you know, there are things in all sectors, but you know, there is abuse that happens. There are things that happen that are not right. And I would not uh, be supportive of something saying you cannot take photos because I feel like that could possibly prevent something from happening and save people's lives. Thank you. Representative Ruth, same, same question. Yeah, as you indicated, this is not law yet. This was somebody, somebody's idea. And uh, the reality is that you know, every day that we're down in that General Assembly, somebody comes up with some idea that nobody's going to approve of. Uh, I really don't think a, a bill like this would have a chance of passing uh, in, in, in large part because um, it's just too, too many things that, that happen uh, and it's too easy to take a picture anyway. You know, you, you take a picture with your phone, you take a picture with your watch, you take a picture with anything nowadays. The likelihood of a, of a law passing or this bill passing is, is, is slim and probably none. Um, I would not support it. You know, there's, to me, if you are doing things uh, that are inappropriate, it needs to be exposed. Uh, I would, however, uh, you, you know, support not taking pictures of people that are in there uh, without their permission. Just like if you, you know, you don't walk up to somebody on the street and take their picture. Um, I would protect those, uh, the privacy rights of the individuals. But if somebody in that hospital is doing something inappropriate um, and a picture would reveal it, I have no problem with that at all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sticking with you, uh, this next question, how did SB202 make it to the floor? Um, and there are three parts to this question. How did SB202 make it to the floor? Were there no Democrats on the committee? And what actions should Dems take going forward to make sure nothing so horrid gets by us again? Here's the reality. The Senate, is majority Republican. So is the House at this point and the governor's office. So, you know, to answer the first part of your question, how did they get there? They got there because they have the majority. And I don't know of any, maybe one Democrat voted for it. It started in the Senate. When it got to the House, uh, we fought it and we fought it and we fought it. But the reality is that this is a numbers game. And he who has the most uh, members gets what they want. You need 91 votes 
to pass the legislation. They had 120 something. Um, so they had more than they needed uh, to get it done. And uh, so that answers your question of how, they just have more numbers. And um, even though everybody fought it, uh, we also took it to court afterwards. And, um, you know, because that's why you have the different forms of government that we do have. If something uh, happens in one branch of the government, then you have the, the, the courts to interpret it. Um, and we did go to court and uh, the judges never ruled on it, to be honest with you. Um, and, you know, they're saying, you know, that it's pending, you know, they don't want to do it before the election. Uh, but the reality is that it's a bad bill. Um, you know, the, the fact that you can uh, almost negate an election, you know, by just simply saying, I think that there was something inappropriate done and uh, they can pretty much throw it out by creating a new um a, a new group over the uh, decision as to whether or not it's uh, recalled, repealed or not. It, it's crazy, it doesn't make any sense. But to answer your question, how it got done, it was done because they have a majority, the way to fix it is to go to the polls and vote for Democrats uh, so that we have a majority and we'll throw it out. Thank you, thank you, sir. Um, this question is for the challengers. We'll do, um, we'll start with you, Mrs. McCoy. Um, should you be elected, you'd be a junior member of the minority party in the Georgia House. How will you work with the GOP majority to deliver on your many proposed initiatives? Okay, I'm not muted, correct? Okay, we can great. hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, again, relationships are, are vital. Uh, Mr. Bruce has alluded to that, and I agree with him 100% on that. You've got to be able to work together in order to get things done. I don't think it should only be working with those in the General Assembly. I think you have to build support and momentum even outside of the Capitol. If you're representing the people, you need to have the people backing you up as well. Um, and so establishing relationships and, and building trust as much as you possibly can in this political environment I think that's important. My colleagues in the General Assembly will have to know that my word is my bond. If I negotiate on, on a bill that uh, you know they're supporting or and, in the, and I'm asking them to support a bill that I am proposing, um, my word has got to be my bond. There has to be trust established. Uh, at least collegial respect. And so the voters have to be able to trust me as well, that if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And so I believe that that is the baseline of establishing positive, productive relationships in order to get things done. I will also advocate for people in counties and districts that are predominantly um, run and represented by re Republicans I'm raising up and challenging Republicans as Democrats so that we can gain more seats in the General Assembly um, so that we're not uh, overrun like we have been with this latest bill that you just brought up. Um, but again, it's going to be relationships and trustworthiness and reliability are going to be important, not only with uh, Republicans as much as our try to work in order to get things established for the state, because I only have one vote for my district, but the policies that we'll enact will impact, um, in a lot of cases, the entire state, um, but also with my Democratic colleagues as well. Uh, we're, we're not one in the same in every respect, even as Democrats. And so we have to learn how to work together and um, build positive, productive relationships with one another as well. Come together for a common goal and, and fight together to, to get things done. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kemp, similar but more specific question for you. Um, given that healthcare is privatized and corporate owned, how will you work with the GOP majority to procure a certificate of need so that a hospital can be located south of I-20. 
Yeah, and this kind of goes back to your question to um, Monique, and that is being able to work across the aisle uh, because there is support in Republican um, caucus uh, to, to reform the certificate of need process that has created a monopoly system in our healthcare system. So that is not just something that I, as the next Represent, next representative for House District 61 will believes that we need to address. There are Republicans that agree that there has been a monopoly created in the healthcare system. So I, I believe that there is opportunity there to make progress uh, and reform that uh, process. This. And I just kind of want to add uh, further on to having experience working across the aisle. There are folks uh, that, are, that are across the aisle that I will fight tooth and nail on issues like voting rights, health care, uh, access to our uh, ballot, uh, to the way that our communities are policed, uh, and also in terms of women's rights uh, to choose, uh, LGBT rights. But there's also uh, been opportunities where I, in my professional career, have been able to work with people that I absolutely fundamentally agree, disagree with on everything else. And that is with public charter schools. And I'm willing to go against uh, those uh, that uh, may oppose that because I'm for the self-determination of our people. The only A-rated school south of I-20 is a public charter school founded by a Black woman. And had others had their way, she would not have been able to open her school. And so that is an example of me being willing to stand on what I believe in and uh, produce some results. Uh, as a result of the hard work that we did, that amendment was passed. And it was passed based upon overwhelming support in communities like ours. So I feel like there's a disconnect when it comes to representation. And it's important for us to be willing to do things differently in order to produce results for our children, for our communities, and absolutely for healthcare access uh, in our community south of I-20. Thank you. Um, I'll stick with you for this next question. Um, have you have you ever participated in any legislative session? And if so, what was your engagement? Excuse me, I didn't, yeah. I didn't get to answer it if I was supposed to. Just sorry to interrupt. We'll get to you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I just spoke to that. So I have been an advocate my whole life. Uh, it started when I was a principal of a high school and the governor was trying to line item veto public charter schools when I was in Ohio. I led a high school that was serving the inner city, the east side of Columbus, Ohio, where I grew up. And our students were between the ages of 16 and 22. We were their last hope for obtaining their high school diploma. We were serving students who other schools were shocked when we would call and tell them that their students were on the honor roll or they were students of the month or that we were celebrating them graduating and walking across the stage. And so uh, at the time I got my students together, we went down and testified. We worked uh, with advocates to ensure that our school remained open. And so here in Georgia. I've been down at the Capitol. I had to register as a lobbyist in order to speak specifically to bills through my work at the Georgia Charter Schools Association. I spoke about uh, the school resurgence hall that was founded by Ms. Tori Jackson Hines. The 2012 Charter School Amendment was passed with overwhelming support in communities like ours because of the advocacy and the work that we did in a grassroots fashion. So I've worked behind the scenes to not only get uh, bills passed that support all schools, but also to ensure that those bills that were passed uh, got money allocated towards it. Uh, and so I've worked across the aisle in doing that. As I mentioned, I've worked with folks that I disagree vehemently on other issues, but I believe that we need quality options for our kids because it is unacceptable that only 30% of our kids are on reading level when they go to fourth grade. And so we have to think outside the box work across the aisle, and I've been able to do that at the Capitol during the legislative session uh, on a regular basis in my professional work. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dawson, same question. And just for the record, um, you did get the question about how you would work as a minority in the majority Republican assembly. So you did get that question earlier. Your okay. next question, your next question um, is, um, have you ever participated in a legislative session? Um, and if so, what was your level of engagement? Yes, um, I have. Um, I, I guess um, I worked for my first U.S. congressman when I was 16 years old as a, as an intern. And my first job out of un undergrad, 
I work for the United States House of Representatives. And then I've also, you know, just as a, a, a citizen and a member of the community, I'm always active in these issues and at the at City Hall and at the State High House fighting for the issues that, that mean a lot to me. In this region, I was one of the first voices to call out for a $15 minimum wage. And of course, taking that conversation to the legislature and to city halls. Um, I've campaigned and fundraised for all types of progressive causes, Democrats in Georgia and beyond. Again, I raised my voice legislatively in lobby and support of police and fire salary increases and bonuses. Voting rights, I think last year, uh, I'm really happy with the effort that I ran and dug deep into my own pockets to educate my, my neighbors and the citizens in the district about that, that terrible house bill that tried to suppress our votes. I'm constantly lobbying for environmental justice and reform. Some of the current topics that I've been vocal in sessions on was uh, to fight the takeover of the Atlanta airport by the state this Buckhead succession movement. I've been an out in front speaking up against that and I'm always against states preempting city ordinances on things like minimum wage or short term rentals or e-scooters, anything like that. So I could go on and on, fair housing, have policy papers out on that. I wrote an article that picked up national attention and I actually got a book publication on the condition of housing for Black America and poor America after uh, COVID-19. Uh, and as a businessman and an entrepreneur, constantly guarding my own personal interests to uh, state, federal, and local um, legislative bodies. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank uh, you. Candidate McCoy, the same question. Um, have you ever participated in a legislative session? And if so, what was your level of engagement? have not had the opportunity to participate in a legislative session um, to date. I'm looking forward to being able to do that as a state representative for District 61. I have been involved in the policy development, particularly when I worked for the Department of Defense Education Activity, even after separating from the Air Force and getting my degree in education, I found myself back with the military and serving students of children and, um, excuse me, serving children of uh, those who are enlisted in the, in the military, uh, all branches and, and their spouses and their families. And so I was heavily involved in policy development in that respect. Also, when I worked at the Georgia Department of Education, my first role there was as a budget specialist. And so I was responsible for reviewing and approving federal budgets for school districts throughout the state. And so I intend to take that experience with me, knowing that there are federal guidelines that must be followed, not only when allocating funds, but when spending them and being accountable for them, knowing that there are special rules in place about what can be spent, um, what pots of money can be spent on what items and things like that. I plan to take that experience with me to the state house in my role as a, dis, uh, a, a district um, 61 representative, excuse me. Thank you, thank you. Do, do I get the same question? <laughs> we already know. <laughs> so I will I, ask you a different question. I, I like that question. Yeah, I'm sure I, you I would, have, but, but I, I have plenty the whole of experience. Point, the whole point of the forum <laughs> Um, is to provide I'm people good. with information about the candidates I'm, that they I'm don't teasing, already know. No Thank you. All right. So next question, and um, we'll start with Dawson. This this will be a question for all four candidates. Um, what measures do you, if you're the incumbent, or would you for all the all of the uh, challengers? Uh, what measures would you take to make sure all the municipalities you represent are properly represented, especially concerning matters where those municipalities do not agree? And then the second part of that question is what city do you live in? So let's do it, let's do it in reverse. What city do you live in? 
And then what measures would you take to make sure all the municipalities that you represent are properly represented, especially concerning matters when those municipalities do not agree? Mr. Dawson, you first. Yes, um, thank you. I live currently in the city of South Fulton. I own property in Atlanta. So um, I think this question I'm learning on this campaign, I think it's just an extension of what we've been doing on the campaign trail. You get out there in the districts, you get out there in the cities, you roll up your, um, your sleeves, you put your walking boots on and you see what's going on, what are the issues. I think one way to build that common ground that you're, you're asking about is each of these cities is doing some things right. You know, city of South Fulton had the opportunity to come in and stand up new ordinances. So they were able to become eagle eye on the latest issues that maybe some of the more established municipalities have been lagging on. East Point is doing a wonderful job with um, energy. What, what they're, they're an example to us all for energy. I think we all can share with Lithia Springs uh, our experience being in unincorporated. And you have Douglasville that is uh, stout and has a great uh, public works and government infrastructure. So my strategy would be A, to be out there in the streets, working with all of the, um, the municipal governments. I think as things are right now, a lot of it is them giving the state representative a list and then that representative lobbying for that. I think it'd be great if we even brought some ideas to bear on those local areas. But finally, let's take what each municipality is doing right and clone that in the other areas and give people recognition and props and respect for what they're doing right and then uh, replicate that in the other areas. Thank you. Mrs. McCoy, same question. Uh, what measures would you take to make, well, what city do you live in? And then what measures would you take to make sure all the cities in your district are properly represented? I currently live in the city of South Fulton. And I'll say the, the R word again, relationships. Uh, it would be strategically important for me as a state representative to establish relationships with city municipal, excuse me, municipal leaders throughout my district so that we can form productive relationships and get things done. The other thing is to initiate contact with um, those who I serve and, and who I represent right? Uh, make myself available to them by reaching out to them, having town halls, having work sessions, um, having meetings to find out both what's going on and what are some of the proposed solutions, what are some unintended consequences to the proposed solutions that we're considering, and then making sure that I'm accessible. Um, I don't want to only be accessible when it's time to run for re-election. I want to be accessible all year round and in contact with the people all year round and constantly working. This is a life that I'm used to in terms of being a, a public servant. Uh, again, public service is my entire career. And so one thing I know is that it's important to get input from all stakeholders it's important to establish working relationships with leaderships at all at leadership at all levels, and to put all of that together, um, and, and to develop a functional plan for uh, initiating change. Thank you, um, Representative Bruce. Same question: um, What measures have what? What city do you live in, and then what measures do you take to make sure that all the municipalities you represent are properly represented? I, I live in the city of South Fulton, and as you know, uh, I had a pretty heavy hand in getting the city into existence. Uh, but once you do that, you know, you as citizens elect a mayor and a city council. And that mayor and city council has the closest contact, so to speak, with the citizens. And the way I deal with it is it's like a baseball team. Um, you got nine members on the team and everybody on that team wants to win. All the members of the city council and the mayors and all this, everybody wants to win. 
And uh, but if I'm the first baseman and the ball gets hit to the third base and I run over there, I'm in the third baseman's way and my base is not covered. So my the way I handle this is to let the city council and the mayor of these cities work with their constituents and then they bring to us um, and I chair the delegation for the city of South Fulton. Uh, they bring to us what their uh, citizens have said that they want. And, uh, and then we go uh, take that 40 days while we're in the General Assembly to try to fight for or against those things that this, the mayor and city council bring to us. Now, the, the, the only time that I would go around that is if, because I also represent those same people that the mayor and city council represents. So if people come to me directly and they say, you know, our mayor and our city council are not listening to us, I try to bring everybody together, put them all in the same room. And then if, if in fact it looks like the citizens are correct and the mayor and city council are doing something contrary to what the community wants to do, then I may take an action on, on, on my own directly for those citizens. But for the most part, that happens very seldom. You know, and we work with the mayor and the city council and come up with legislation to support uh, the things that the citizens have identified that they want for their cities. That's how I do it. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bruce. Um, Mr. Kemp, same question. Yeah, thank you so, so much for this question. Uh, so I live in Southwest Atlanta, right near the horse ranch. Uh, and um, got kind of the best of both worlds. I live uh, a block away from uh, the line of City of South Fulton. So um, I would take a totally different approach. And I think that is what our, I don't think, I know that is what our community wants. They do not want sideline leadership. And they also want uh, leadership that does not say come to me, but goes to them. And that is what I've learned uh, through this process of running for office is that our community wants to be heard. There are great things happening in all of our cities, but we must be willing to call a spade a spade and say when something is not working and be willing to speak out on that. Uh, as an elected official, you have a certain level of bully pulpit and leadership that is income, that is kind of given to you and you have to work and earn that and keep that. And you keep that by being someone that is touching voters, working with your uh, constituents and being in their communities versus saying, well, when you come to me, I will make a change or and I will consider it. Um, we have to be willing to speak out and speak up. I was blessed and lucky enough to serve as not only the vice chair, but also the chair of my NPU when I lived in West uh, in the west uh, part of Atlanta. And I saw what happens when you actually listen to community, you connect them with their elected officials and you ensure that they are heard. So much can happen. And in addition to that, I believe that what we need is leadership that will say, you know what, legislation or uh, other things need to be amended uh, to ensure that we are having productive government for our citizens. But ultimately what our constituents want is to be heard. I have been shocked by how many people I have went to their doors and they said, I cannot believe you are at my door. I've never had this happen. That is screaming to me that we need change and we need new leadership uh, at the state house and representing our communities. Thank you, sir. Uh, this next question came from the viewing audience. Um, and it is a question for all four candidates. And so we'll start with you, Mrs. McCoy. Um, as a state rep, how would you fight to ensure every Georgian has access to the ballot box? Well, well the first order of business would be uh, trying to overturn the law that has already been signed into law, certainly supporting the lawsuit that um, is currently in litigation and, and hoping and praying that that will come, come back uh, to us in the right way, in a favorable way to the constituency. But the other thing is voter education or, or uh, citizen education, just teaching people and reaching out to people to let them know the value of their vote. And, and again, not doing this just when it's time to vote, but letting this be a constant campaign Right, reaching out from those who are approaching voting age, you know, starting 10, 11, and 12 years old, and, and making sure they are aware of why their vote matters and what are the consequences of not voting. 
to ensure that uh, you're represented in the way that you, you want to be represented. So to me, I believe voter education and reaching out and keeping that campaign going and making sure people are aware of both what's going on, how the legislative process happens, what are the results when um, things are signed into law. If you're not truly represented by those who are elected, um, I, I would want to make sure that, that they're aware of that and, again, keep that as a, a top line item on my list of things that are important to keep going. Thank you. Representative Bruce? Yeah, let me kind of switch it around because everybody does have access. The problem is a lot of people don't take advantage of that access. We have a, a lot of people that have not registered to vote. Uh, we have a lot of people who are, have registered and still don't go vote. Uh, so I, I think the challenge is not to, so to speak, to, to say everybody has access, gets access, because everybody has access. What we don't have is education uh, for people to understand the importance of exercising that access and going to the polls and voting. And then we have to do things to make it easier for people to vote, not more complicated, more difficult uh, for them to vote. Um, the ballot box should not be uh, hidden. You know, we had the, the, the ballot boxes that were outside the buildings, and uh, now they've said that they're going to be inside the building, which makes no sense, because if the building closes at 5 o'clock, then you don't have access anymore. So the question becomes, how do we make it easier for people to have access to vote and, uh, and how to educate people on the importance uh, of them getting out and exercising their right uh, to vote, you know, how they're impacted by, uh, by that. So um, I, I, I differ on the question. Uh, as I said, everybody has access, but everybody doesn't exercise their right to it. And we need to encourage people uh, and motivate people to do that. Thank you. Mr. Camp. Yeah, I feel like we need to be more engaged in terms of engaged voters. There are folks that are in tune and that will, you know, tune in to watch this wonderful forum that you're putting on. But there are so many other voters out there that need to be touched and engaged. And I believe that we once we do that, we will have more people showing up to vote. Um, one of the things that I was super excited about that I was working on uh, not too long ago is uh, working with When We All Vote, uh, the initiative that uh, Michelle Obama has uh, led. Uh, we need to get our young voters engaged and active. In addition, my family was one of those families that went out and passed out waters, which is now illegal to do. Uh, and uh, sadly, uh, you know, we you know be, need to be willing to get in good trouble to push up against some of these heinous and horrible things that are being done uh, to our voting rights. Um, and in addition to that, uh, you know, it's sad that Republicans have are actually hurting, hurting their own voters by some of these restrictive measures that they're putting in place. So obviously we need to be willing to fight against all of these restrictive measures that they're putting in. But at the end of the day, it's about engaging our voters and getting more folks into the uh, electorate. And I believe we do that by having more grassroots uh, work in our communities, going door to door, engaging voters, and whoever uh, wins the seat, prayerfully it is me, and I would be so honored to, to hold this seat. We have to get to work in other communities to ensure Democrats get elected. That's how we change the atmosphere in Georgia, is getting more Democrats elected, uh, for example, outside of Metro Atlanta, but we only do that by going in and working and going grassroots door to door with voters. And so that's how we change the uh, atmosphere in our state, getting more Democrats elected to the state house. Thank you. Candidate Dawson, same question. As a state rep, how would you fight to ensure every Georgian has access to the ballot box? Okay. I think uh, more, more of the same, more of what I'm doing now. I've put my um, money where my mouth is. I've spent thousands out of my own pocket last year and this year getting the word out. Uh, about those Jim Crow 2.0 racist, blatantly racist laws. And I've, I've been vocal like that. Let's call it what it is. It's not just 
voter suppression is Jim Crow 2.0, a new iteration of the Ku Klux Klan and all that bad stuff. This is a rotten, rotten bunch of people we're dealing with on the other side when it comes to our best interests. So I'm calling them out. I'm putting my money where my mouth is. Uh, you can go to electdawson.com or just log in in any of your social media sites. You'll see I, I'm, I'm educating the voters everywhere I can. I'm going door to door. Then also I wanna throw the gauntlet down at the foot of the black men in the community. I don't know what's going on, but uh, the enemy, you know, these people across the aisle, they've been successful. They've just made black men totally apathetic and taking us off the chessboard in this. Here you all are, South Metro Democratic Women's Council. And you know, as I said, I've been there with you guys every step of the way. But the men in the community aren't doing the same thing. I put out this weekend a photo of Dr. King voting in 64. In my district last year, in the municipal elections, almost 68% of the voters were women. Where are the men? Men have to stand up and be men again. And uh, bringing the youth into the process, I got engaged in all of this because of uh, parents and a high school principal. I did youth congresses, youth senate, senates, moved uh, legislative bodies as a young man, and it got me into this process. But instead of blaming those guys across the aisle, which, like I said, they're they're a bad, bad bunch. You know these Jim Crow 2.0 folks. The black men in this community and the men in general have to stand up, man up, get Thank your you. head in the game, and vote. Thank you, sir. All right, so there are two more questions that have come in um, from the viewing audience. One is for the challengers and the other is for Representative Bruce. Um, I'll do the challenger question first. Um, this is for all three of you and um, we will do ladies first then alphabetical order. So here's the question. Uh, should you successfully unseat Representative Bruce who sits on the appropriations committee, how would you negotiate with the GOP to prioritize democratic priorities in the budget? Hmm. Well, I think that goes back to what I said earlier and what I've pretty much been saying throughout this entire session. It's, it's establishing relationships and being able to work across the aisle on things that we can find common ground on. I, I can't imagine how much that will be. I, I don't want to try to forecast how many, um, you know, Republicans I might have something in common with that we might be able to agree on. I, to be honest, I don't anticipate it being much, but for the sake of the people I represent, if I'm fighting for what they said they want, I'm willing to do that. And so appropriations committee or any other committee that I'm on, that doesn't restrict me from proposing legislation that will best serve the people that I represent. And so uh, again, it's just establishing relationships and finding ways to work with people on those things that uh, are necessary to at least try to work with them on and not giving up if it doesn't work the first time. I'm not a quitter. And so if it doesn't work the first time, I'm not going to lay down and say, well, that's it, we're, we're finished. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep negotiating. I'm going to keep fighting for what the people who I represent said once. Thank you. Candidate Dawson, same question. Yeah, whoever answered this question, they really struck at the heart of the matter. The budget is the number one place that we can get things done in the community. And this is where the, the Republicans and, and some ineffective Democrats are really killing us as a community right now. The way grants are scored against our $30 billion budget, that, that formula is cutting us out of the mix. They, they write everything so that the money goes to rural or suburban areas and not quote unquote urban um, areas. We know what that's code for. If you look at GDOT's budget, there's $4 billion in major road improvements planned for the next decade. Every one of those, every penny of that is going north of um, I-20. You go up to I, you go north, you're seeing beautiful 
clean roadways and here our community has to get out and do the cleanup. So all that has to be called out uh, fiscally and we have to demand equity there. Same thing with housing, we get the federal funds from HUD, it comes down to the state level. By the time it gets to the state level, then that's going uh, to the departments that handle that, the DCA department, Department of Community Affairs. And uh, that money again, is not coming to us, it's going to the rural and suburban areas. So it's going to take a uh, stout leadership, someone who's not afraid to call these people out and to get line items. Let's just cut the bull and get line items in that $30 billion budget that is that those line items are expressly meant for our communities south and west of I-20. Thank you. Mr. Kemp, same question. Can you repeat the question, please? Yep. Um, should you successfully unseat Representative Bruce, who sits on the pro on the Appropriations Committee, how would you negotiate with the GOP to prioritize? Democratic priorities of the budget. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to make sure I got this correctly um, because I've done it. I have worked with members of the Appropriations Committee uh, to get uh, to advocate for funds to be uh, awarded to, to uh, bills that were un that were passed uh, in prior years. Uh, in addition to that, I've worked with uh, both the House and Senate. Uh, chairman and also subcommittee chairman, because as I mentioned at the onset, uh, education is almost 40% of our state budget. And so I've had to work behind the scenes with these individuals uh, to get uh, funds appropriated. Uh, for example, there uh, was a bill in which support for public charter school facilities uh, was unfunded. Uh, those schools, as a result of our advocacy, got $50,000 uh, during my time uh, with GCSA to uh, ensure that they were now not taking money from the classroom to uh, pay for an air conditioner. And so I've been able to do that. Uh, for example, the vice chairman of the education subcommittee is a Democrat. Uh, so that just shows that we can get in leadership positions if we're willing to work across the aisle. Uh, you know, Representative Glanton out of Clayton County is uh, the vice chair of the education subcommittee. I've worked with these individuals. I've gotten funds appropriated through our advocacy. Uh, and I fully believe that I will be able to deliver for our citizens in House District 61. Thank you. Um, Representative Bruce, um, what are you most proud of with your involvement in the Appropriations Committee? Like what accomplishments are you most proud of there? Um, and what more are you planning to accomplish should you get the next term? Well, first of all, just being able to uh, get on that committee is significant. Um, there's not very many people that are, are in the Democratic Party that serve on the Appropriations Committee. And, um, you know, we've been able to do uh, a number of things. Uh, part of the um, uh, piece that makes me most proud is education. You know, the funding that we have put, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but the um, amount of money that we put into education um, it was millions and millions and millions of dollars. Um, we have been able to get the um, money put into transportation, um, money put into uh, health care, all of the different uh, pieces. I have an opportunity to sit at the table and, um, and, and help make the decisions that everybody else is saying they want to create the relationships to do it. I'm already doing it. I'm already sitting at the table. Um, one of the, the, the subcommittee that... Um, uh, one of the subcommittees that I serve on, on appropriations uh, deals with public safety. And uh, we're making sure that the police officers are properly um, equipped with all of the, the things that they need for their safety and the safety of the people that they uh, service. Uh, I'm already doing all of the things that everybody says that they want to do. And, and, and again, I appreciate, you know, I want to be able to say this because I want all three of them to understand that I was in the same position that you were in um, when I first decided to run. Uh, but the difference was I worked with uh, 
representative, well, he was a representative then became Senator uh, Julian Bond. And I learned how to do all of this stuff before I ran for office. And, uh, and again, I'm, I'm glad that you guys want to participate. I'm glad that you guys want to uh, contribute, but there's an appropriate way to, to go about doing all of this. And sometimes you got to learn how to do it before you get out there and try to step into it. And um, that's why I said, you know, one of the things when, I, when I'm reelected uh, that I plan to do uh, for these next two years is to help educate someone, whoever it might be, on how this process works uh, so that when they become the, the representative, they will know what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bruce. Uh, <clears throat> one more question. And this is for all candidates. And we will um, we'll start with you, Representative Bruce, and then go in alphabetical order. So alphabetical order by last name. Uh, so uh, candidate McCoy will be last. Um, what are the most pressing environmental issues that need to be addressed in this district, in the state of Georgia? And what is your view on how we address these issues? Well, you know, in, in the environmental, uh, there are a lot of environmental issues. You know, we have um, along Fulton Industrial and um, other parts of that industrial area, uh, there are some companies that are doing some um, some things that put some pretty bad stuff out into the, into the atmosphere. Um, and we've had uh, some court you know, cases that we uh, put in place to try to force these companies uh, to do things to preserve the air, preserve the water, uh, and to make sure that the environment that we uh, are working, uh, living in is safe uh, for uh, ourselves and our children. Um, the, the other piece of it, too, is we have to introduce people to um, the areas where they can get a good, um, health, healthy type atmosphere. I have a, a walk that, that I sponsor every Tuesday at Sweetwater Creek State Park. And uh, there's, there's several people, new people every week. Uh, we walk that, that the trails over there um, along the water. And I'm introducing people to uh, that atmosphere uh, over at Sweetwater Creek State Park. Uh, a lot of uh, our folks don't know that that uh, facility is there. It's about maybe 10 minutes from the uh, city of South Fulton. And um, you know, all of you are welcome to come walk, but you have to introduce people to the environment, educate them on uh, you know, the need to to, to preserve our waterways, uh, to not litter and throw things in our sewer systems that uh, the sewer systems can't handle. I mean, this, you know, it's, it's an, an introduced legislation to help restrict, you know, these companies from putting, from making things in the manufacturing process that uh, pollute the air. Uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Uh, we said alphabetical order, right? So that's Dawson, you're next. Yep. Um, you know, of course, the number one issue um, is these warehouses, number one um, environmental issues, is these warehouses. We have to guard the district from the improper zoning, these predatory practices and misguided development. Make sure we have quality places to live. Um, we have to do our part to make sure that warehouses belong in industrial districts, not in our backyards like we're suffering from right now. Today it's happening in South Fulton and Union City. Tomorrow it's gonna to be the entire district and the entire region. You know, and this is really um, environmental racism and environmental injustice. This redlining where they put these polluting industries inside of our communities and near our communities where they need to be cleaned up. So there are things that you could do like East Point did where they got a a brownfield assessment grant uh, a few years ago. Of course, we're gonna to wanna to strengthen zoning laws, clean up some of the past laws and ordinances that keep these industries and these pollutants outside of certain um, areas. You can't just do it with fines and regulations. And we gotta get rid of a lot of state preemption that allows them to come in in the first place with these uh, economic and environmental injustices. So um, this is a great, important thing. Look at us, we live in a food desert in the year 
2022, when our, when our uh, community is suffering from all these health and nutrition disparities, and we have the population, we have the finances, but still there's a, a food desert where our children, our seniors, our families can't even get a healthy meal. There's not enough access to fresh produce and, and state-of-the-art grocery stores and other quality retail amenities. So this is a big uh, topic for me. I'm working hard in that endeavor now. I plan to do more and would love to have legislative policy power that I could address this and fight this, but we're gonna fight it in office or out of office. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Kemp, same question. What are the most pressing environmental issues that need to be addressed in this district, in, in, in the state of Georgia? And what are your views on how we best address these issues? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I, I just have to address something uh, that was said because I was shocked to be told that I am not, or we are not, uh, as three folks running for office, the correct way are not going about it the appropriate way. I feel like that is what is wrong with our politics, that we have uh, politicians that feel like they are only uh, the ones that can be kingmaker. This is about what voters want. This is a, legis uh, a, a, a election process that we have all went about the appropriate way going down, getting qualified, speaking to voters, knocking on doors, earning folks votes, telling them where we stand on issues. And so it is not for one person to tell a community, a, a, a district uh, who should be in a seat. It is the people's seat and we will run to earn your vote. And so I'm so uh, thankful for the opportunity that you are putting, to, putting this on, educating voters, uh, but we have more work to do and we're doing the work. Uh, and I don't want to discredit any of the uh, folks on this uh, call that they are not going about it the appropriate way. The appropriate way is to engage voters and ask for their votes, not to wait for someone to tell us that we're allowed to run for a seat. Um, so uh, beyond that, I want to answer the question about environmental issues. So uh, I, you know, fully support the Green New Deal, but I want to bring it home a little bit more. I uh, own an electric vehicle. Uh, we see almost every commercial nowadays, uh, ever since the Super Bowl is about an electric vehicle. Um, we need to do more to ensure Georgia is well equipped to handle uh, electric vehicles in our communities. Uh, you know, we are uh, moving towards an environment in which we are going to have more electric vehicles on the roads, but we need the infrastructure. And so that's uh, advocating for the federal dollars to ensure that they are in District 61. Uh, right now, in order to get fast charging, uh, we have to uh, go uh, sometimes uh, into the city in order to get that done. And there should be uh, fast charging stations in our district uh, and in our communities. In addition to that, uh, we need more a green space in our communities. Uh, it is uh, unfair and uh, injustice that black communities uh, you know, suffer from some of the uh, worst health conditions and it's as a result of the environment that we live in, from warehouses to pavement, to uh, be in the concrete jungles. And so we need to ensure that our communities have green spaces uh, where our children can play and live, but also where they have a healthy environment. Thank you, sir. Candidate McCoy, same question. What Wait. are the most- I'm sorry, go ahead. What are the most pressing environmental issues that need to be addressed in this district, in the state of Georgia? And what are your views on how we best address these issues? Okay. Um, warehouses are certainly uh, the top issue, at least in this area that I'm aware of, and particularly warehouses that are adjacent to residential areas, um, whether we want to say they're in our district or not, they're right across the street. So if across the street is another district, then we need to do something about working with the representative from that district and the leaders, the municipal leaders in both areas in order to address this issue. Um, and I do find it troubling that this does happen in predominantly Black neighborhoods. Um, and so we need to go safeguard our quality of life when you invest in homes and, and where you live and you love where you live, you, your uh, quality of life shouldn't be impacted by warehouses that are uh, putting out uh, pollution on a regular basis right next door to you or right across the street from you. We do need to strengthen the zoning laws. 
We also need to enforce the laws that are already on the books. And then we need to be careful about um, and keep an eye on municipal municipalities that approve variance requests. Uh, zone, zoning is done for a reason and, and they should, it should be done logically um, and intentionally. Uh, but so when variances come up, they should be approved uh, rarely and, and not on a regular basis, especially uh, if the residence input has not been taken into account. I do also uh, want to comment on this notion of succession. You know, uh, one person, one legislator picking who will succeed him and then the next person doing the same thing. That's quite troubling to me. And so I'm glad that I'm not the only one that picked up on that. Uh, we do live in a democratic society. And so the voters are to choose who should come next, not the person who's sitting in that seat. If that's the way we govern, nothing will ever change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And candidates, we have reached uh, the end of tonight's forum. I thank you all for the questions that you um, entertained thus far. We have one more two minute section for each of you and that's your closing. Uh, and we will go in the order of Dawson, Kemp, McCoy and State Representative Bruce. So um, Mr. Dawson, your two minute close, please. And great, uh, thanks again. Great to be here with this organization again. We want the record to reflect I've been a supporter of you all, your, you guys and the uh, Georgia widows, and ministers, wives and widows. You guys are some of two of my most favorite organizations. Love to support everything you do. Thanks for having us here. I think this Robert Dawson again, um, offering myself for service. This is about providing effective leadership and a functional government. I've heard from the neighbors. I see the vision, the neighbors, um, demanding the visions that the neighbors are demanding. We need a master plan for the district that delivers the future growth and prosperity that we know we deserve. We need entertainment venues, upscale retail, fine dining options, class A office space, quality grocers, plus an end to the food desert that we're living in. To get all this done, we need leaders who are collabor collaborators, facilitators. We don't need any more drama. Our future is not served by divisive politics, dysfunction, or stubborn public policy. I'm deeply concerned that without proper planning, spending and policies will continue to hit roadblocks and dead ends as a rising region. Despite the negative sentiment and news coverage, our district is a great place to live. All these value propositions, proximity to the airport, affordability, the region's most undeveloped land, we must showcase this to the citizens and neighbors. I want to be a representative of that, a shining representative of that. And our re reputation must reflect the strong families that make District 61 a quality place to live. We are not the Douglas and Fulton County that you hear about on the news. Let's build the community we deserve. I'm asking for your support right now, and I'll work to make these amenities a reality. It's easier than we think. Than we think. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Candidate Kemp. Yes, thanks so much again to you, Elise, and thanks to the uh, South De Metro Democratics uh, Women's Council for hosting this forum. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, what we have here is a choice, and it is my responsibility to get the voters to choose me as your next state representative, and I believe that you will ultimately make that choice because I am a leader who is produce results as an educator, as a nonprofit executive, and someone who has proven that he is willing to work across the aisle, but also be willing to work for and with the people. I believe ultimately it's about ensuring that our communities are better and ensuring that uh, the status quo is no more. It is not okay with me that only 30% of our children are reading at grade level by the fourth grade. It is not okay with me that the only emergency uh, hospital in South Fulton is no more. It is not okay with me that vo voting rights is under attack, and it's absolutely not okay with me that 
people think that they can tell a woman what to do with their body. And so ultimately, I think this forum has shown us that things need to change in our politics, things need to change in our approach to how we work with and for community. It's time for a fresh approach, one in which says it's for the community to decide who sits in a seat, it's for the community to decide who is representing them, and it's for a community to decide what happens in our state. And so ultimately, I'm asking for your votes. I can't wait to get to meet even more of you. I've been out knocking on doors and doing the work, and I'll continue doing that because that is what is missing in our district. Uh, you can learn more about me by visiting my website. It's RashawnForGeorgia.com or going on social media and checking us out. It's RashawnForGeorgia on all social media platforms. I am a father, educator, community advocate, and I look forward to being your next state representative for House District 61. Thank you. Candidate McCoy. Again, thank you to the South Metro Democratic Women's Council for hosting this. I am Monique McCoy, and I'm running to be your next state representative for District 61. Again, I'm a veteran, I'm an educator, a small business owner right here in the city of South Fulton, a community volunteer, a mother and a grandmother, which is a perspective that none of my uh, competitors have. And so I want you, I'm trusting you, as voters to do your research, check each of us out. And I'm trusting you to make the choice to vote for Monique McCoy. I'm going to be ready to work for you and start fighting for you on day one. I'm not going to wait until I'm in, in uh, excuse me, until I'm starting to serve in order to figure out what our agenda is going to be. It will be our agenda and we will have established it. The moment I hear that I am I won the election on May 24th, I'm going to get to work to start soliciting information from you. Let's sit down and start talking and putting together our agenda so I can start working for you starting on day one. I'm looking forward to continuing my career of public service. I served in the military. I was willing and ready to fight for my country. And I stand here now willing and ready to fight for you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. If my two minutes weren't up, I'm asking everyone to please go to my website, McCoy61.us, so you can learn a little bit more about me. And if you want to get in touch, you'll be able to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Bruce. Okay, I want to correct one thing. I am not suggesting who is the next uh, person to succeed me. What I'm suggesting is that whoever it is, is educated on how the process works. And if 10 people come to me or 20 people or 100 people come to me and say that they're interested in uh, succeeding me, my intention is to educate them on how the process works so that when they do run, that they will in fact know what they're doing. Uh, I'm not trying to pick the next person at all. Uh, I'm not asking people to uh, let me select. I'm just asking them to let me educate them. If somebody is interested in running for this position, I just want them to come and talk to me so that I can kind of open the door for them and let them see how this process works. What I was looking for earlier, I, I, I just misplaced my notes. It was $15.4 uh, $15 million going into uh, uh, pre-K uh, to 12th grade. Uh, we were also able to appropriate uh, 287 million in, uh, in, in salary increases for teachers. Um, that's not enough, but it is a start. Um, also, the uh, um, amount of money that uh, we were able to appropriate uh, to help uh, put school, school buses uh, up to date, because a, a lot of our school buses are uh, not up to date and we want to make them safe. So all of the things that everybody says that they want to do, I'm already doing it. And, and again, um, I want to be clear. I'm not trying to pick my successor. I'm just trying to educate whoever it is so that they can, uh, in fact, know what they're doing uh, and establish you know, the relationships ahead of time before they get there uh, with the uh, opposition. Uh, and I say opposition, meaning the Republican Party. Uh, you, you do that before you get there. And again, I'm not trying to pick my successor. I'm just trying to make sure whoever it is is educated on how this process works and to do what I can to help them. And thank again, you. thank you. 
thank you to every candidate who participated tonight. We appreciated um, your time and attention, your thoughtful answers, um, and you've certainly provided um, all who view uh, this forum, uh, lots of information about each one of you. So thank you very much. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to our president, Mrs. Gloria Jenkins. Thank you, Ms. Fisher, for an excellent job moderating. I think none of the candidates can say that we were unfair to them. We, as an organization, we tried to do what is right. And you heard our mission earlier. And one of those missions, our missions is to create educational opportunities. And the forum that you participated in tonight or you watched tonight was one of those uh, activities. This was certainly educational. Each of the candidates rose to the challenge and it's going to be interesting. I'm glad I'm not in that district and we'll have to vote because it would be tough. But congratulations to each of you and thank you for participating. A few announcements. Tomorrow night at six o'clock, there will be an agricultural candidate forum at Urban Farms in College Park. Urban Farms is located between Lyle and Washington Road. And this is sponsored by Representative Mandisha Thomas who is one of our members, as well as our organization. Look for a two-story house uh, on Main Street. And I think it's across the railroad tra track from Jean's Plumbing. So that should give you a landmark to find us. And all members who are coming tomorrow night, please wear your blue tops at least and we will have a table set up to provide water. On Thursday night, we will have a forum for our Senate candidates who are running. And again, the forum will be at seven o'clock. Participants in the forum will be on Zoom. Those watching will be on Facebook and YouTube. On Sunday, if you know anybody who's getting a check from Social Security, we are having a Social Security Sunday, and that's at 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. And we're trying to make this a statewide organization. Our Republican friends are saying that they are going to sunset Social Security and Medicare if they retake the Senate. Well, we know that it's already scheduled to be sunset, but the issue is whether they will refund it. Now, they shouldn't have a problem because we are paying the money, so they shouldn't have a problem with that, but they will make that an issue. So this event on Sunday afternoon is just to let people know what is going on with Social Security, how we can protect it. And our main speaker is John Bauman, who is president of the Social Security PAC. He will be our keynote speaker. And then we will have Congressman Hank Johnson uh, Congressman Johnson and I were doing a news conference in Centennial Park on Social Security, and we were evicted from the park. So this is what has grown out of that eviction. We're trying to do this statewide. We're asking communities, you can get your family together and just talk about it. But at four o'clock, we want everybody to talk about social security. If it's just you and your husband or you and a child or you and a neighbor, just talk about what is social security? Are you getting your best from your, your plan? 
And of course, we all expected this nice raise in January and they did give it to us, but then Medicare premiums went up and that took the raise right back. So there are a lot of things going on with social security and Medicare. And we want to be aware of it, do what we can about it. But if we work together, we can get more done. And in closing, if we stand together, we will win. Thank you again and have a super evening. Thank you. Thank you.